I, I think when it comes to inventors, you know, deep inside all of us is a little voice, a little voice that tells us what we should do, what we must do. Some people don't listen to the voice and live, as they say, lives of desperation. Inventors listen to the voice. They see a problem that they can fix. And when you hear that voice inside that says, you know, Eureka, you just have to see it through. And, and, and it really is, when we use the term inventors, I really like to use the term entrepreneurs because all entrepreneurs are inventors, but not all inventors are entrepreneurs. The successful inventors are entrepreneurs. They can think about it in a broader context. You know, when it comes to inventing ideas, you can be sort of a lifestyle entrepreneur, inventor, a problem in your house and you come up with a solution and that's wonderful. The next level though is when you say, this isn't just a solution that's valuable for me, but there could be a lot of other people. And that's where that entrepreneurial vision of being able to put it together is really critical. It doesn't matter to get the inspiration, but to make the idea happen, you have to be whole brain. Or you've got to have a partner that gives you the other half of the brain. And by brain, I mean a right brain visionary, but at the same time, left brain logical and disciplined to turn the dream into reality. Anybody can come up with ideas. Commercializing the ideas, making them into a business, the entrepreneurial sense, you need to have as much dreams as you have discipline to make that happen. In today's day and age, it's much easier to be an inventor than it ever has been at any time in the past. I mean, this is truly the most wonderful time to be an inventor because corporations are open to buy. I mean, massively open to buy. They call it connect and develop. The challenge in today's world is, is you, you gotta learn how to speak the way the corporations speak. And the problem most inventors have is they've got an idea for a problem, but that's not necessarily a business opportunity. And there's a difference between an idea that solves a problem and an idea that is, as I say, capitalist creativity, something that you can go do. But there's never been a better time to be an inventor. The internet makes research and testing better than ever before. India, China, and Walmart have, are the greatest thing to ever happen to an entrepreneur because what it's done is it's put pressure on corporations that they've got to grow or die. If you don't have something unique, then you become a commodity and you sell for commodity prices. So the corporations are massively, now my stock and trade, just to be clear, my expertise is working with the Fortune 100. My business and my life has been focused on working with the large corporations. I started at age 12 inventing juggling kits but my life for now going on you know, almost uh, 30 years now has been major corporations helping the biggest companies and the biggest brands do things. That group of people are desperate for inventions. They're desperate for ideas to do it, but they don't need an idea. They need something that they can actually turn into a business. And that translation from the invention, uh, the way I break it down is this. You've got the inspiration moment where you get the idea, but then you have the commercialization, turning it from an idea into a business proposition. Then you can sell the idea. You can sell it to funding sources so you can do it yourself. You can sell it to a corporation. It does not take large amounts of money to do things, but there's a couple things that you gotta be aware of. The number one most valuable thing as an inventor is a library card, okay? okay? It's a library card. Because if you go to your library, in most major cities, they're a patent repository, and they've got somebody there that can help you. There's books, there's information, it's all sitting there. An internet connection can get you 80% of it. And the fact of the matter is people aren't willing to put the effort in. See, the difference between a real entrepreneur is, is that they gotta have it. They, you gotta want it. You gotta want it that you're willing to put the hours in. It's hours, it's not money. It's hours. You gotta be willing to dig and dig and dig. If you're looking for a lottery ticket, give it up. 
There are no free lottery tickets. That's why all those scam artists that advertise their 800 numbers drive me crazy. Because people expect they can get a lottery ticket. That ain't the way it works. Okay? You gotta want it so bad that you're willing to put the time in. I do a radio show on public radio, and people call up and say, I got an invention. I said, I'd like to sell it. I said, well, what have you tried? Well, I haven't done anything yet. I said, have you knocked on a door? Have you knocked on 20 doors? When you knock on 100 doors, I'll talk to you. Yeah, but they may say no. Yes, so what? You're looking for money. When you get one of these things sold, I mean, money just shows up. Every three months, you get a check. Okay? This is a big deal. You've got to be willing to put the energy in. Do not. There is no one out there that you can take your invention to, give it to them, and they will pay you for that idea. You've got to be willing to put the perspiration into work. The difference of Edison was he was willing to make the time to put the prototype together. He was willing to work. Edison put the time in. He knew that a prototype, making a demo, was critical. And so when he would come up with an invention, he didn't just come up with a, a sketch on a napkin. He would turn around and prototype it. It doesn't have to be pretty, but you need to show me the effect. And let's be clear, licensing corporations is not the preferred choice for an entrepreneur. The preferred choice is to go into business for yourself. And in fact, if you want to make the most money, the best route is get it to what's called first sale. Get a product out on a shelf somewhere. Because the corporation is going to pay you five times more money if you've reduced it to practice and really have real customers buying it, even if it's in a little town, than they will for an idea that's sketched on paper. When you have an idea, the first test is, is it really a great idea or not? Second is, do you want to do it yourself or do you want to license it? If you want to license it, I still would make you go back again and say, go make some. If you want to license it, and you still want to license it, then you've got to have a utility patent. No utility patent. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Okay? Game over. End of decision. Okay? I know the big corporations. They're not going to pay you money unless you've turned it into tangible property. A patent, ideas are, are cheap. The supply way exceeds demand. But ideas that have been turned into tangible property is when it's a patent. And that's not a design patent, which is what these scam artists, these cheats and crooks will tell you. You know, they'll do you either a design patent, which is worth nothing, or they'll give you what's called a trophy patent, a patent that has such narrow claims, it can't stop anybody from doing anything else. What the company's going to buy is they're going to buy from you the ability to prevent anybody else. They're looking to buy a monopoly because you make more money with a monopoly. Your job as an inventor is to take to the corporation a monopoly, and that means it makes a meaningful perceptible difference and it's protectable. The issue of an a fair appraisal is a, uh, I wish there was simple answers. It gets complex because of some legal issues, which is public disclosures set patent clocks moving. And so it's not a, there isn't a simple answer. I will tell you though that the vast majority of ideas are great ideas for great businesses. They're not patentable and they're not licensable. That doesn't mean it's not a good idea. I had a board game, one of my first board games that I did, that I ended up licensing. And I was looking for that kind of feedback because I got, everybody in the family loved the idea. So what I did was I had somebody I was working with, because most inventors are working nights and weekends, that's how I started. And, and so we were traveling to another city where this person knew a bunch of people. So what she did is she told them that a friend had invented a game, not saying it was me, and said, wanted to play it and give some feedback. So a little bit of a ruse, but we went in and played the game. And they commented on it, not realizing that it was me. And then at the end, of course, we, we admitted what it was. But it was an eye-opening experience. Because what my mom liked 
and what they thought was not necessarily the same thing. Now, in today's world, one of the easiest ways to do this, this was sadly <laughs> too many years ago, in today's world with the internet, what you can do is you can write your idea up. Write it like you were sending an email to a prospective customer, and then take some friends. There's some research on this with academic journals, that when professors write journal articles at different universities, they actually become more powerful papers, and they get actually cited more. So if you take your idea and you write it up like you're writing it to a prospective customer, and then email it to three friends, an old college friend, an old high school friend, and say, okay, if this is the idea, what do you not understand? What do you understand? What questions do you have? What's good? What's bad? And then email me back. That's one of the cleanest ways to get some feedback and some information from people. And it costs nothing. It's a, it's a stimulus response. Grow or die. The natural human condition is to create. And the stimulus of new things that happen create a chain reaction of new ideas. You know, eBay is created and a whole chain reaction of other things happen. In, global warming's happening. That's causing things. The nature of a man is to make things better, is to become better. That's what separates humans from everybody else, is we want to work smarter, not harder. Yeah, I mean, I can sit out there like my granddad had years ago and work the farm up in Maine, you know? But our goal is to go up Maslow's Pyramid. That's the human condition. And in fact, that's what makes this country so unique, is because the melting pot of all these people came together and the diversity of these cultures came together and this diversity, diversity we measured at the ranch, and the more diversity of cultures that you have working on a project, the greater your ability to create ideas. Now, the exciting thing that's, that's happening now is, is that that diversity through the internet, we're able to do this on a global scale. And so the human condition can now start to do these things. Now, to be clear, we've got challenges. But the good news is, is that there's plenty of kooks and crazies out there. Because, you know, I mean, one of the things that gets me about this stuff is whenever we talk about inventors, we always like to talk about either stereotype them as, as the kooks in lab coats or, or to turn around and, and talk about the ones that get all rich. Well, the fact of the matter is, is the common denominator to these people that really do this is, is that they're all a touch whacked, which is great. They're the rebels, the renegades, the people who the status quo cannot be lived. The people, who, you know, if you're politically correct, if you're proper, if you're adult, if you're mature, go to jail, go right to jail, not collect $200. The patent office only gives patents to kooks and crazies. If your idea is obvious to somebody skilled, it's no good. Isn't this wonderful? I mean, it's so cool that the idea is to break free. And now there's some people that that's the spirit. Now, I mean, John Hall came to this country in 1620. My family's been here for since very early. Some say we got thrown out of England because we could, couldn't, couldn't do it. But there's a spirit in this country, and there's a spirit that's growing globally. I mean, my radio show, they listen to it in Africa. I mean, hello! I don't get this. There's a spirit of people that want to do it, and I'm excited. I'm really excited because, you know, the 60s was a time, and then that kind of spirit, that idealistic spirit that we can do something about the world, kind of got sold out to the money as we all went for our fine European touring sedans and the lifestyle. But I'm encouraged that my children are turning around and they're concerned about those things that when I was younger we were concerned about. And I think the baby boomers, as we all go into retirement, we're going to look at our legacy and say, you know, this ain't what we were hoping for. And so I am very encouraged that what we're going to find is that over the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see a resurgence of people creating ideas for the common good, be it for health, be it for the environment, be it for helping one another. Now, that may be idealistic foolishness, but I really do think there's a step change coming. And the power to do that is the Internet allows the individual to have access they never had before. And so I'm extremely optimistic about the future.